have one in the front seat. But. So it's the sweep, the swipe, and the swap. <laughs> okay. So when you're collecting, especially post-monsoonal, there's these little tiny bees. I probably got 300 of them yesterday. It was crazy. They're about that big. Okay. Between the, the fattest part of my fingers, not, not really, really small. And um, you can't see them on the flowers usually. You might see that the flower looks a little blurry, but you can't actually see the bee. And so you sweep across the top of it, just back and forth like this. If it's a hard plant, you might have to push on your hand a little to push it because the, the flower can be, the bush can be a little tricky. And when you look in your net, you'll find that it's full of tiny little bees that you wouldn't have known were there otherwise. So that's the sweep. The swipe, if you have, um, you know, pretty much any sort of big flower, a sunflower, a penstemon, globe mallow, something like that, a swipe, of course, is as quickly as you can, straight across it. Bees see about 300 images for every one that we see. So they see you moving before you've even registered the thought that you're going to. So you have to be really, really fast. If they see you coming, they are gone. So I often come up below them and catch them that way. That seems to help a little bit. And I'll, we'll go over all of this today. Um, can I get someone to volunteer their arm just for a second? You? Okay. Come up here. So if you imagine, bend your arm. This is a flower standing up here. If there's a bee over here, and I swipe this way across the bee, as the flower bends, the bee gets pushed to the ground away from my net that slides across the top, and you miss it. So come always from the side that the bee is on, if you're catching, so that you don't knock it out of the way with the plant stuff. Thank you. <laughs> and then, so what do we do? Sweep, swipe, the swat. If you have, um, when I was first getting started, are they doing all right in there? Well, they're knocking on the door. <laughs> they want attention, always. Uh, when I was first getting started in Pinnacles, I got my start in Pinnacles National Monument, and the second year that I was out there, um, the botanist asked me to find, make him a list of the plants that, or the, the bees that were visiting this rare plant called Gilia capitata. And it was this long stem, kind of like an onion with a ball of flowers right on the top. And would I come out and tell them what was on that? And the first day we went out, of course, it's a rare plant, seldom seen. And sure enough, there was a bee on it, took my net, whack, right off the top. Oh. The head of the flower went, <laughs> and he looked at me he's like more like Gilia decapitata. He was so mad at me. So if you're in a situation where you could lop the head off your precious flower, the swat is the best way. And the interesting thing about bees is that they always fly up. When you've caught a bee on the ground, it, if you hold your net, it will fly straight to the top and try and get out. It won't go to the bottom. So even after I've caught a bee, as long as I'm holding it like this, I don't have to do this and hold it tight. You can just loosely hold the top up and they'll continue to fly up here. And then you can slip your hand underneath and do whatever you want without fear of them coming out. They always go up. Okay, so the sweep, the swipe, and the swat. We'll practice a little today just for fun. Who had this one? Someone loaned it to me. Was it you? Who had this? You had it. Okay. okay. So I'm going to load up really quick. We're going to walk down here and see what we can, what we can see. We'll talk about them as we go. How many of you are photographers? Does anyone do macro photography or flower photography? Is there any interest in I knowing how to take pictures of bees? Yeah. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the techniques if you ever want to take a picture of a bee, what features might be important, and how to take pictures of them so that they look like they're sitting on a white background. We'll talk about that. Collecting bees is a lot like a, like a mountain lion. Like a pool of water or something where you put it stalker, and you hold still and you wait to see what's going to happen. Um, usually the minute you come up the bees fly away and as you stand and wait then the bees stop again. So I spend a lot of time walking and stopping and staring. And walking and stopping and staring. Right, so this right here, as it flies, you can see that the legs are kind of dangling below the body. That indicates wasps to me right away. That too. See how it flies and the legs were down below rather than tucked up tight. And it was slow. It flew pretty slow, didn't you think? Now this. See right there? Let's see what this is. Okay, I'm going to catch this, and those of you that were at my talk the other night, I want you to tell me what this is. <laughs> <laughs> Look 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. If I told you there was a test, you wouldn't have come, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give everyone a chance. Tell me what you think we have here. Maybe I can catch two so we can get two other ones. Bee wasp. Uh huh. Bee wasp fly. Bee wasp fly. Now, if you weren't here the other night, you're forgiven for not knowing. The rest of you. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> collect a little bit of mud, um, collect a little bit of moisture to take back to the nest, but the majority of the insects that you see along muddy areas like this are not bees. They are the least frequent, native solitary bees I should say. They are the least frequent vi visitors to muddy areas. Okay, challenging you again. You guys will be good at this. It is one of these vials that's easier to see into. This is fantastic. What do you know about midgets? Midget. There's like bees? a little insect that's called a oh, midget. Oh, the midges? Midge. 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 Yeah, midges. Uh, very little, actually. Uh, they're a pest. Mm -hmm. They drive me crazy, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Fly fishermen like Get <laughs> on this. Don't say. Tell me what it is. In your mind, save it. Okay. So that everyone gets a chance to try their hand. Identification. <laughs> Yeah, I want you to get that one all the way to species. A uh, bee. Okay, what kind of bee? Honey bee. Honey bee you're thinking? No? Bumblebee? Okay, look again. Look at that thing very closely. Do you see antenna on that thing? No. This is a fly. This is a fly mimicking a bumblebee. Remember those antenna. That is so easy to see and so key. This is a perfect mimic. It's a beautiful it's mimic. It's not quite yeah. that triangular shape of the wings. Are like right, yeah, tiny. well, exceptions wow. to every rule. So here's a fun one, and I'm going to tell you right now, this is a bee. Woo yeah. We're finally to the bees. This one is in the family Megachylidae. The family Megachylidae includes the leaf cutter bee, the mason bee, the wool carter bee, the blue orchard bee, all of these bees that you've heard of. Many of the ones that we manipulate and use for pollinating orchards are in this bee family. And the reason that I know the family is that when I look at the abdomen, it's yellow, bright yellow, covered in pollen. The Megachylidae bee family, the females, collect pollen on their abdomens instead of on their legs. So here's a perfect example. She's been very busy this morning. Pass that around, let everyone take a look. When she says Megachylidae, that's a Megachylidae. And you can see in these pictures, thank you. All the genius for bringing this. Oh, see all the pollen on the abdomen right there. And you can see those in the hands. If we're done with that little fly, whenever you're done, just let it go. It's something to think about if you're ever collecting bees in the wind. That is like a flag blowing in the breeze and scares the bees away. I usually keep it tucked up so that it's not flying around too much. Sun, sunflowers are great for bees, some you don't see as much on. I don't know if it's the quality of the pollen, how easy it is to get it out of there. Chopping mm -hmm. off the top. <laughs> yeah. Look at all the grass out there. I've yeah, seen some of, these, the some of these horses, they dig on the thistle flowers. You know, that's what they have. They don't just take those So, she's going to settle down in a minute and be easier yeah. to look at. Notice that when I take this and tip it this way, she oh, always oh. goes up. It doesn't matter. So, I can take the lid off and she'll stay in it because she goes up. But take a look. Tell me what you think this is. First of all, bee. And if it is a bee, can you tell me what kind of bee? 
Hopefully this one's fairly easy for people to identify. Um, if not, let, we'll practice today and, and figure that one out. That's a, a fairly common bee, especially in agricultural settings, areas like this that are a little more open. You might even see her house somewhere around here. Yeah. I'd say she's a honey chicken. Very good. Yeah. 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 Somebody used to have a hive and the down the road, and it, they don't have it anymore. Instead of carrying dry grains of pollen, they actually carry nectar and pollen together in this muddy mass that they press onto their legs. They pack on like um. I, I like adobe. You've heard about the old adobe tiles that they would make around their quad muscles. Same idea, just packing it onto their body and taking it back because they need all that moisture to make the honey. So it's a much wetter pollen load. I'm guessing it's uncomfortable to tuck that muddy mass up close to the abdomen, right? And so they carry their legs a little bit lower. That's totally a guess on my part, but it seems like it. So when you look at a honeybee leg, you'll see that the back leg is flattened, it's sometimes shiny. If it has pollen on it, and that one doesn't, it would be this, it looks like yellow mud. It's just a packed, kind of wet, moist it off and sink. Yeah. So one of the first things bees do when they think there's a problem is shed the pollen, make themselves as light as possible. She, she might have done that. But you can still see that flat shape on her back leg. It's called a corbicula, is the name for that long, flat structure that she packs the mud into instead. So you want to take a look. You can see here, let's see, we have a close-up of her leg. So that's a mixture of uh, pollen and, and nectar, nectar together. together. And what's the difference in the nutritive uses or values of, of pollen and nectar? Yes. Pollen contains the fat. Pollen contains the steroids, the hormones, the amino acids, all of those things. The protein uh -huh. is all in the pollen. Okay. In fact, a lot of plants make a, a protein layer around the pollen mm -hmm. that you don't find yes. in wind pollinated plants. There's some thought that it's there as an attractant for the bees, uh -huh. along with other purposes, but yeah. that's one part. Okay. And um, uh, the nectar is sugar, sure, just sugar, and that's pretty much it. There's some that produce some alkaloids and things like that, but overall it's water and sugar and that's it. So let's see, I have a picture of that. So here you can see, this is the corbicula here up close, just so you can see on that back leg. You can see her leg is very different looking. Even then something right over here, let's look at, see here? See how that's that fluffy pollen in the hairs versus here it's, it's a flat surface. Not a bee, not a bee. Let's go. Yeah, if everyone's seen it, is everyone done with this newest fly? Okay. Wasp? Oh yeah, look at that. You don't have to catch it, just observe. Again, the wasp behavior, they crawl on the ground, they're looking for homes and nests. Of course, they're often ground nesters too. They're looking for prey. She might be, you know, using her antenna to smell something. Might be looking for her nest. Maybe she got stepped on, I don't know. But the wasp behavior of being on the ground it's so quite common. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've ever watched a bee walk on the ground like that, ever, mm -hmm. in 20 years. So that's pretty distinctive. Have you guys ever, do you guys want to see a pea flower? We can talk about the pea family. We've been going Let's move this flower. Here, pea flower. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever looked at a pea flower up close, but they have um, the banner, which is the upper petal. And uh, we could pick off a bunch so you could see. On the sides are what's called the wing petals, and then at the bottom is the keel. It's two pieces that fold together, and a keel is in on a boat. And the anthers are inside the keel. And it's fascinating to watch something in the Megachylidae bee family because when they land on it, they put their back legs on the two wing, on the two keels half of the keels and spread it and those anthers pop up and hit them right on their belly which is where all their pollen collecting hairs are. All that pollen rubs right off on their belly. This one's been tripped and so I can't show you on this one. Yeah, lupin is a great one because they have a bigger flower. It's actually easier to see on them. Um, anyway, t you can take a look at one of those and see. It's kind of fun to look at how the bees have learned to manipulate that rather complex flower.
It's really cool. Do any bees thing. do that though? A lot of bees do They that. do, oh. Okay. So one of the biggest ones would be the carpenter bee that you had oh. that picture of. Oh, okay. Yes, honey. Okay. I'll open it. So um, if you look at a tubular flower, um, penstemon comes to mind that it's such a perfect corolla tube, but let's see, what else is there? Caprifoliaceae, what's the common name for um, Gooseberry? No, what is um, it? The uh, long, white, tubular flowers. Oh, yeah, the, not, not Nicotiana, you're not talking about that? No, not, no, no, not oh, okay. that. Not Datura. No, it's a bush, a big, real common, white, tubular oh. flowers. Can't think of it. Anyway, any sort of yeah. long tubular flower mm -hmm. limits the size of the pollinator that could get in there and collect the pollen. Limits who gets the reward. And there's no spot to lay down, baby. But one of the things that um, bees have done is taken that uh, act of manipulation on the part of the pollen, the plant, and gone around it. So they'll go to the back of the flower, to the base, where it connects to the stem. And they'll cut a little hole, a narrow little hole, stick their tongue in, and collect the nectar out of there without ever touching any of the, the anthers or stigma, any of that part of the flower. And what they do is remove all of the nectar so that then even the tiny bees don't want to visit that flower the correct way because there's no reward for them in there in terms of nectar. So they ruin the flower when they do that. So interestingly, there's some research that shows that at least some flowers have said, we're going to make it not worth your effort to cut that little hole in the base and do that. And they make their nectar really watered down. And that super watered down nectar doesn't appeal to the bees. It only appeals to the... Who did this? Fantastic. <laughs> this is a cuckoo bee, guys. Oh, Here's cuckoo a cuckoo bee. Oh. Let's take a look at that. Oh, we'll pass wow. that around. Anyway, so then only the hummingbirds visit those flowers. Oh, cool. They get the bees to stop visiting at all and get rid of that, that cheating relationship that happens there. By, um, That's a cuckoo bee. The hummingbird doesn't mind the, the uh, watered so down nectar as much as the, the mm -hmm. bee would. Mm -hmm. So this is the cuckoo bee. For those of you that were here the other night, the cuckoo bee is the parasitic one that sneaks into the nest and lays an egg. And the egg has the little caterpillar with the scissor-like mandibles and snips the other one in half. This is the adult here. Did you catch her on the ground or on a flower? On the flower? Okay. Good catch. All right. Yeah. All right. You'll see them on the ground, too, looking for nest entrances. They, they lay in the nest of another bee? In the nest of another bee, yeah. So they sneak into the nest of a normal bee and um, crawl to the end and usually lay the egg. I talked about how they put the egg kind of behind the pollen that's being put in there. Yeah. The other thing that they'll do is actually dig a little tiny alcove, I guess? Uh, like niche? Is that what we call them? <laughs> As we have in our little adobe houses yeah. in the wall and okay. put the egg in there and then build a little, they call it an operculum, like a door over the top. So the egg is hidden in the wall yeah. so that it can't be seen by the host bee yeah. who's in there getting the pollen and oh. nectar for her own offspring oh, yeah. and then she lays her egg not yeah. knowing there's an intruder in there yeah. and seals off that nest right. in this case it's always in the ground yeah. and then the both eggs hatch this one mm -hmm. was laid a few days earlier so it, right. it hatches a little right. bit earlier right. and it's got a head start yeah. and it kills the other right. bee and then eats right. the pollen that was in there. Uh, so it's not a carnivore, it doesn't eat the, the larvae, it eats the pollen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, back on yeah. that bee that, that, that uh, uh, bites a hole through the base yep. of the flower. Yep. Nectar but, robbers. You know, I've, I've seen that, but I've still seen other bees oh, yeah. come to the flower. Mm -hmm. So they're still picking up some they, they, Probably they, pollen they're, in that they're, case. They're picking up yeah. some pollen that way, because yep. they, they can't really tell until they get in the flower, right? They can smell. They can smell whether there's pollen in there. They do have a sense of smell. That's what those antennae are for, the antennae are how they smell the flowers, which oh, is why they have oh, such nice, oh, robust antennas. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Huh. What are the characteristics that make you know right away it's a cuckoo bird? I mean, it's a cuckoo, cuckoo bee? Cuckoo bee. Uh, honestly, in this case, I would say experience, right? I've looked at enough bees okay. that I know when I see that pattern that that means it's a cuckoo bee, it's a nomada. I know that group, and so from there I can backtrack and say I know nomada are bees, therefore it's a bee. So you would say this is a nomada? Uh, this is right definitely a nomada. You can't point out something because it's just a So no, because it's very nomada. wasp like The cuckoo yes. bees can look yes. very wasp like, but no, nomada are real distinct in that red and yellow. They have antenna just like the wasps. Yeah. Very striking. Oh. Go ahead. Find it. The wasp have antenna too. Yes. Oh. Yes. 
Hymenoptera, that whole group has, has pretty good antenna. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. So, it's one so of the, the problem on these is, is, how do you tell if that's a male or a female? There's no pollen collecting hairs on either the male or the female. Yeah. One thing you could look for is after she's dead, if you put her on a pin, if she has a sting, right? The sting is associated with female, so that would tell you. That comes but right the other technical way is that if you were to count the number of little segments in her antenna, the antenna are made up of doo -doo -doo, little segments all hooked together. Awesome. Males have 13 and females have 12. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh sure. Oh, yeah. Ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no 13, yeah. 13 and 12. 13 yeah. and 12. The yeah. males have Funny. one extra segment. Uh, so of course, there's, there's like two exceptions to that in the world, but generally speaking, <laughs> males have one extra. Why do they need that? I'm guessing it has to do with the fact that in addition to smelling flowers, they smell females. They find the females. They smell out pheromones and so on. This is the other way to say a seagull. That's it. That's going to be dead and pinned down for you. If you don't have hives near you, mm -hmm. then you, you don't have very many honeybees, right? right? Well, yeah. What's their range? Up to, I think it's three or five miles, I can't remember uh -huh. which, but so fairly pretty, far, yeah. but yeah. The farther you go, obviously, the less there would be as they radiate out from the right. central location, yeah. but yeah. Um, <laughs> knowing you don't have one near you is the hard part. Yeah. Right? Because well, the feral Well, there is a bee person, a honey person, that's okay. about two miles north of me. Uh, okay. What is that? I saw that swat. That was awesome. Ooh. Let's see. So I'm looking at the face and I'm seeing the no antenna. Your net's a yeah, hard one to see through. Let's pull it out. So I'm, I'm thinking fly. I see those skinny back legs and I think I see the stubby antenna even before I've got it out. Let's double check. Would you agree? Does that look fly like to you? Just to me. Yeah. Just to me too. Not wings. Good. Good. But I mean, Shape of the wings. The wings. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. Right. And can we see an antenna? Man, listen to no. We just see a little shape. stubby right in the middle of his forehead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Two little tiny stubby things. Uh huh. Not mm -hmm. So this is one we haven't collected yet today. That's a lovely little bee. That's a that's an anthophora. So it's a digger bee. This is a kind of digger bee. They nest in the ground. They'll dig out. It looks like a gopher mound. They'll dig out a little burrow and nest in the ground. You can see a little tiny bit of pollen. She was collecting pollen on the, the bind bee here. This way can fly up. She doesn't want to fly up. Getting stuff off her legs. So we just caught a nice digger bee, if anyone wants to see it. It's in a vial up there. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's collecting pollen on the bindweed. Oh my gosh. That's one of that stuff is everywhere. Exactly. No, that's actually the truth. She's going to hide her baby. So in New Mexico, it's really easy because you can kind of divide it up as in before the monsoons and after. Okay. There's different bees in both. With the exception of, of course, the honeybee, which occurs across it. So the honeybee was brought over to North America around 400 years ago. It wasn't here before. These guys, so they, they, they evolved on separate continents, right? And so you can imagine they've become quite different from each other, right? So the ones here, there's about 4,000? 3,500 to 4,000 in North America, about 1,000 in New Mexico, and um, none of them are social the way the honeybee is. None of them have maybe none of them have honeybees. I was just going to ask you how we have dealt with Intentionally, for their pollination, for the honey. I mean, this is a bee. I even know what they're on the ship. 
Yeah, we brought them with us on purpose. At the same time, the apple came, and there's some thought that they were brought together on purpose because we have got apples are an old world flower also. And they did. The Hispanic, they came up from Mexico and they also came to New England. So two times. And for a long time, the New Mexico honeybee had a very separate genetic makeup than the ones there. Now they've mixed so much that they're not a separate thing. But the New England of the Yep. Yep. But the natives come out right when the apples come. I've noticed in my yard. Yes, that's Just true. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this year there weren't any. Apples. Yeah. I would have to say though, uh, just point out that that's definitely probably coincidence because the native bees here didn't evolve with the apple, right? They evolved with ro other roses that are here, so they're probably coming out with maybe native roses or something instead. Not quite enough time, no. I guess I don't know how long it takes to evolve, but my understanding is unless you're a virus or a bacteria, it takes a little bit more time. Then again, there's the, what is it, the moth in England, the peppered moth. Was that 50 years? So yeah, maybe, maybe they have. Bunch of them. These are mostly, these are all flies and beetles, but there's a really cool fly in here. So when you think about predators of bees, I think most people think of birds and lizards. <coughs> I don't know, that's what I think of. I would say probably the biggest predators are, you know, viruses and bacteria that make us sick. You know, bees get the same, <coughs> not the same ones, but they also are, get colds and whatever. But uh, I would say other insects are the biggest predators, biggest enemies of bees. And here's a wonderful example of one. This is called a bomboleid. It's a kind of fly. And what they do, they ho they're like hoverflies and they'll hover near a ground nest mm. and hover over it and then flick their abdomen and shoot an egg oh. Oh. into the nest. Oh. The egg rolls down, hopefully makes it fairly far back into the nest and then when it hatches, the little larvae crawls back to the pollen and eats the pollen meant for the, the baby. Huh. So yeah, oh this my is, gosh. and if you ever look at a, a um, there's a kind of bee, it's a, uh, a suite of bees in the genus Diadasia, and they build nests in the ground. I saw some yesterday by the Pilar Bridge. Right there, there were some nesting in the ground. I, almost, I can't show you a picture. But they build an, a flat nest and then a little turret up over the top, like a chimney. Sometimes it's even got a little crook in the neck, so it looks like a periscope. How tall? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going like this. And I know yeah, well, I'm like exaggerating. That. It goes like this. Yeah, because we can just walk all over them. Right, yeah. Um, they're pretty noticeable, and there's some thought that one of the reasons they do that is to make it harder for a bombolia to flick an egg into this that nest because it's got the hoverfly. Hover 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 and let me show you a picture of the diadesia nest. I think there's one. And you dedicated your book to mothers. I did. All right. So this is the female longhorn bee. The males have antenna that literally go back and can touch their abdomen. These are specialists on the anything in the sunflower family, and the rabbit brush is one of their favorites in the fall. And look at that pollen. Wow. Wow. She's been very busy. Is that a spider? Just a, yeah, lots a honey of spiders bee. down it's here. A beautiful honeybee. Yeah. Huh? Oh, it's a female longhorned bee. The genus is Melisodes. Melisodes. Yeah. Look at all that stuff on the legs. That stuff is what? What is that? Pollen. Pollen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like chaps, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Giant chaps. She's packed it in. Yeah. So much. Yeah, she's been busy. Wow. So she'll take that back to the nest and shuck it all off and, and um, maybe regurgitate a little bit of nectar to make it depending on her. Uh, the genus is Melisodes, but the common name is a longhorned bee. The males are super easy to identify because the antenna are as long as their body. They just curve over. I really wanted to catch one, and I can see them. The things that are flying so fast mm -hmm. over the top of that are the males. I just haven't caught one yet. Maybe I'll try one more. That is another cellophane bee, much bigger, definitely a different species than that first cellophane bee. Cool. That's exciting. If you look at her face, if she holds still, her eyes look like if you were to draw a line along them, they would eventually meet. So it gives her face this heart shape to it. It's a heart shaped face. And that's distinctive. 
She also, if you looked on her wings, one of the veins has this big S curve in it, which is only those bees have that, which is why when you take pictures of bees, if you can get that vein, you can say, oh, I know it's a Calides because you can see the vein. Pictures are nice because you can zoom way in. It's as if you have